Um, okay, so our next speakers, uh, we have a trio, in fact. Uh, I'll, I will introduce uh, one of the trio who we've agreed will introduce uh, the others. So I will introduce Dr. Jacqueline Wicks, um, who is a Buddhist chaplain and teaches Buddhism. Um, she's a former research fellow at the University of Queensland um, and holds a PhD in mathematical science and an MA in linguistics. Um, and she will uh, introduce the other two speakers, who are Dum Cho Dyson and Talia Newland. And they will be talking on personal reflections on Rigpa and the aftershocks of the fall of Sogyal Rinpoche. So thank you very much. And I'll pass over to Jack. Good afternoon, everyone. In July of 2017, eight senior students a very well-known Tibetan Buddhist teacher, Sogyal Rinpoche, who was the founder of Rigpa, an author of the best-selling Tibetan book of Living and Dying, wrote their teacher a letter. This letter soon went viral and sent shockwaves through the Buddhist community worldwide. The 12-page letter outlined years of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse of students and the use of donations to, to support his extravagant and gluttonous lifestyle. In the wake of the public scandal, including the response from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Sogyal stood aside from his position. And yet, today, two years later, the Rigpa community remains deeply divided, with many still choosing to remain loyal to their former guru and to justify his actions on the basis of Vajrayana teachings on guru devotion. Today, two former Rigpa students, Damcho and Talia, are going to speak about their own personal experiences in Rigpa. Dan Cho was a student for 15 years. She became a nun and a personal attendant to Sogil. And she was one of the authors, one of the eight authors of the letter that finally crapped through the facade of Rigpa. She's speaking publicly about her experiences for the first time to us here today. Talia was a lay student for 20 years. When she heard the letter was coming out, she set up um, online spaces where students would be able to go to reach out and support each other and work through issues. She's just finished her book, which is really marvellous. It's called Fallout, Recovering from Abuse in Tibetan Buddhism. And there are some copies available in the bookshop. So Damcho will speak, and then Talia, and then I'll make a few comments at the end. Um, my name is Jackie, and I've never been a student of Rigpa. Thank you. Sogyal Rinpoche was the first Buddha teacher, Buddhist teacher that I came into contact with. And in light of the last talk, which I'm very grateful for, I'd like to mention to everybody that doesn't know Sogyal, Sogyal is not a monk, and he has no precepts that prohibit him from consensual sexual relations. Like many others, I met him at a time when I was yearning for a way to make sense of suffering after my life was derailed by a series of traumas. When I felt like I had nothing left to lose, Sogyal's best-selling book, The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, provided me with great support and tools. I didn't want to fall back into the confusion and suffering of my life and so reasoned that I should surrender my ego to the teacher and follow him and the lineage of the Buddha's teachings that he was transmitting. I'd already noticed the benefits of meditation and contemplation, and so dismissed a number of the concerns that arose in those early days. As a community, Rigpa has a, had a culture in which faith and devotion, rather than rigorous study, were emphasized. The few who openly questioned Sogyal's manner of teaching were made an example of through a publicly humiliating dialogue that could completely hijack a teaching session. 
We were told by Sogil and his senior students that these so-called training sessions were activity teachings, and Sogil's erratic and tantrum-like behaviour was crazy wisdom. And the way to view it correctly was to cultivate pure perception. I blindly trusted in the authenticity of Sogil and his methods. By the time I moved to Larabling, Rigpa's main centre in France, I was inspired to take monastic ordination and aspired to surrender myself to the teacher and be trained in the manner of the great saints of the past. Therefore, when Sogil first corrected me by striking me across the top of my head with a wooden back scratcher, I took this as a blessing. Over the years, I became closer to Sogil and he gave me greater and greater responsibilities for his household and personal affairs. Now his personal attendant, the frequency and severity of private beatings and public humiliations increased. For many of us in the inner circle, it was not uncommon to have multiple lumps on our skulls or split scalps from beating. He once ripped my ear. We all saw that his worst moods were caused by problems with the young, attractive females, students he'd groomed for sexual relationships that were on call to him 24-7. Only later was I to hear from some of them personally that they had been raped. They were coerced into the relationship by being told they were engaging in consort practice, karma mudra. Yet somehow we kept each other afloat by reflecting on the karma we might be purifying and the ego clinging that we were loosening. In 2008, six years after taking ordination, I started having waking and sleeping flashbacks of his beatings and verbal abuse and began to feel physically ill at the sound of his voice. Sogil sent me to Rigpa therapy, which was supposedly a fusion of Western psychology and the Buddha Dharma. I was grateful to have someone I could talk through my challenges with, but the therapist manipulated me too, telling me that the beatings and trials were nothing to do with Sogil, but rather with some past issues with a family member that needed to be purified. Two years later, two visiting teachers could see that something was not right for me. They encouraged me to speak to them, something that we're always warned against as no one will understand. The first told me I was too close to the fire and so was being burned. He encouraged me to slowly and skillfully take a step back. A few weeks later, the second told me this is abuse. Upon hearing those three words, I finally saw the entire history of my training for what it truly was. Over the coming months, I secretly planned how I could run away from Lara Bling. And when I finally did, at the end of 2010, and went into hiding in India, I was publicly discredited and shamed by Sogyal. It was at least three years before the traumatic flashbacks and nightmares eased, and more years before I could turn to a professional therapist for help. In 2017, I joined seven other current and former Rigpa students who wanted to hold Sogyal to account for his behaviour. Each of us had different stories, and when we spoke together, we realised that the damage went far beyond our individual experiences. Our open letter outlined the main concerns regarding Sogil's misconduct in relation to sexual, physical, emotional and psychological abuse of students and the way in which his actions had tainted people's appreciation for the practice of the Dharma. The letter quickly received wide coverage and has led to support networks being set up and official invest investigations launched in France, the UK and Australia. Since co-authoring this letter, I have heard many more extreme and profoundly disturbing accounts of Sogil's abusive behaviour and can state that what has been published in the press and the official, official investigation merely scratches the surface. <laughs> So when I and other ordinary students read the letter, we were shocked, angry, disappointed and sad. 
Knowing that people would need a place to talk about the issues, I set up the What Now online Facebook group and also a blog. And in that group, I heard many stories of people who had been harmed by Sog Eagle's abuse and heard stories of how people had spent years in therapy trying to recover from the trauma. And yet some students didn't believe the letter writers. Others, some or many who had been abused themselves or had witnessed abuse, refused to see it as abuse. They saw it as crazy wisdom. The unconventional behaviour of an enlightened master done out of wisdom love, supposedly to speed us along the path to enlightenment. These students saw in maintaining this view as vital to their spiritual progress. Others, though, felt that abuse could never be justified or condoned, and that beliefs such as crazy wisdom merely enabled the abuse. Anyone who accepted that they had suffered or witnessed abuse was faced, was faced with having to reevaluate their experience and even their perception of themselves, something which takes a lot of courage. And in our online groups, we supported each other through this process. The Sangha split. We had Sogil's supporters and defenders on one side, and we had on the other side those who supported the abuse survivors and the survivors themselves. Those who could no longer see Sogil as their teacher left the Sangha grieving for what they'd lost. Attendance at Rigpa events dropped. <clears throat> Sogil's defenders blamed the victims for feeling harmed. They said that the problem was their incorrect or impure perception that they didn't understand Vajrayana and that they lacked the capacity to practice it. Such students accepted abuse as part of the tradition. They blamed their troubles not on Sogil, but on those who spoke out. They called them Samaya breakers who would go to hell, a perspective that was fostered by several lamas who taught in Rigpa in 2017. Sogil resigned and ran off to Thailand. He took no responsibility for the causing harm. He made no true apology. He simply said that he was sorry that they felt hurt. And instead of showing compassion for the victims, he and other lamas spoke of them misunderstanding his behavior. Rigpa management basically took the same stance. They showed no compassion for the victims, only concern for themselves as an organisation, something which turned a lot of students away. And they chose spiritual advisors and teachers who gave the impression that accepting abuse was a necessary part of Vajrayana Buddhism. Since this doesn't reflect the essential Buddhist stance of non-harming, we wondered whether Rigpa's kind of Tibetan Buddhism should even be called Buddhism. Rigpa management did institute a code of conduct, but it has serious flaws. They did set up an independent investigation, which confirmed the abuse. However, Rigpa has never accepted the findings of the investigation, and despite appearances, have done little to implement its findings and its recommendations. They have never denounced Sogil's abuse as harmful and unacceptable. And unless this is done, Rigpa cannot be considered a safe organisation. In the group, we actually found Western psychological perspectives more helpful than Buddhist teachers. We learned about such things as the dynamics of abusive relationships, trauma and recovering from it, and complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which we saw in the abuse victims. We also learned about cults and how to recover from being in one. And I cover these kinds of topics in this book. And they're the kind of things that Buddhist teachers tend to not know about. It's not covered by the Dharma, but it's very, very relevant in an abuse situation. We also, um, we also learned about, yes, okay, so <laughs> um, these studies also taught us to recognize Rigpa's ongoing psychological manipulation and encouragement of spiritual bypassing and trance and dissociative states. We came to realise that we'd been brainwashed into thinking that public humiliation and bullying that we all witnessed was kindness. This seems very warped to me now. In the sport group, we questioned everything. 
And since we couldn't trust an external guru anymore, we turned to the guru and sound ourselves for refuge. We vowed to trust our own wisdom, wisdom and future and not be so gullible. Many left Tibetan Buddhism. Some left Buddhism entirely. Others stayed but decided not to seek another teacher. So what happened here was that Sogyal desecrated the sacred role of teacher of the Buddha Dharma by misusing the teachings to enable his manipulation and abuse. And we students threw our discernment away in the name of devotion. As you know, the case of Sogyal Rinpoche is not an isolated incident. It does occur in a monastic situation and in many of the Western groups. And unfortunately, many lamas and students in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition appear to accept that abuse is a legitimate part of Tibetan Buddhism. This taints the whole Buddhist religion and it cannot be allowed to continue. We know that the Buddha did not advocate the use of physical or verbal violence or people teaching the Dharma, manipulating and coercing students into having sex with them. And he did not advocate crazy wisdom. He skillfully adapted teachings to suit every kind of student and never found it necessary to resort to such methods. So why are they being used? Well, as we've heard, the argument is that they speed up students' path to spiritual awakening. Our perspective is that these behaviours are merely an expression of craving, aversion and delusion of the teacher. In Vajrayana, much is made of the helicopter ride to enlightenment. But the reality is, for so many students, this, this has become the helicopter ride to, to profound, long-lasting psychological harm. What happened in Rigpa is really testament to the capacity of the human intellect because we're so very smart and we're so good at mental gymnastics that we twist things and we're able to justify anything as right and ethical. And here we have seen it even within Buddhism itself. But no, this is not Buddhism. The Buddha saw with great clarity the nature of the human condition and how we could be happy and live well. The solution he gave us was simple. Sure, it's hard work, but at its core, it's simple. And that is to be our truest and our very best selves. So the thinking that took root in Rigpa and in, and in other groups is 180 degrees off track. Maybe one day Sogil will be able to get off his throne, take off his hat and robes, put on normal clothes and go to a Dharma centre and become a student of the Buddha Dharma. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's all finish by sending a message of loving kindness to the many people who've been affected by abuse in Buddhism. Let's send loving kindness to all the people who have been affected by abuse in Buddhism, lay students and monastics, to everyone who has been hurt, to those who have felt that their lives have been ruined, to all the people who tried to speak up for years that were just ignored or ridiculed to all the people who have felt that they were taken advantage of. May they all find true peace and healing. May we all find true peace and healing and may we accomplish the awakened way together. After all, we all walk this path together. Thank you. So to Dam Cho, Jacqueline and Talia, um, wholehearted thanks. And once again, the only word I can really think of is courage um, and also gratitude. You know, it takes such courage.
courage to speak from the heart as you did, um, but gratitude for sharing um, because it is, is through speaking through the heart in such difficult circumstances um, that really deep transformation can take place. So we really appreciate that. Um, and that goes for our first speaker as well. Uh, Tenzin Dedon, you know, amazing uh, talks so far.